my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, our very own Dr. Jim Wilworth. Uh, Jim is our viticulturist uh, here at Covey, joined us in July of, of 2010. We're very uh, excited about uh, his addition to the Covey team because he was our, our first position that came into the Institute uh, such that half of his time is spent on uh, outreach to the grape and wine industry and half of his time is spent on, uh, on applied research as directed by the grape and wine industry. He's actively involved in a number of outreach activities as well as research projects, primarily focused on grapevine cold hardiness, including the development of the vine alert system. And I'm sure we're gonna hear lots about that uh, today. For a little bit of background on Jim, he attained his Bachelor of Science in Biology from St. Mary's University in Halifax back in uh, 2001. He then uh, came here to Brock uh, shortly thereafter and took our certificate in grape and wine uh, technology, uh, part of our OEBI program, and graduated from that in 2004, and then continued on to get his PhD in plant sciences, uh, specialized in enology and viticulture, uh, uh, and graduated from that in, uh, officially in 2011. Jim was born and raised in the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, he actually started working in vineyards in Niagara prior uh, to when he started graduate studies under the supervision of uh, Dr. Amy Reynolds. His PhD research uh, focused on understanding Riesling terroir throughout the Niagara Peninsula. He previously worked as the Quality Services Sensory Coordinator at the LCBO before we attracted him to come and join the Cubby team uh, 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 with the rest of us. His current research focus uh, is on understanding the impact of viticultural practices on grapevine cold hardiness. Thank you very much, Debbie. Welcome everyone here today on this uh, beautiful March, uh, March day, and also to all of you uh, off campus who are viewing. So the overview of my talk today, just to give you a quick overview, is looking at some of the research that I've been doing over the past year. Uh, initiating my research program uh, when I arrived last year. And so we're just starting to get into some of the real nuts and bolts of, of what I'm working on. So I want to give an overview of that and also discuss some of the uh, some work that has been done looking at viticulture practices, how it impacts fine cold hardiness. And I'll also address some of the current situations that we're, that we're seeing in terms of fine cold hardiness and, and what we're working on with that as well. So in terms of an overview of, of my research, uh, Winter injury is one of the greatest threats, if not the greatest threat to the success of our, or of our industry. Uh, and it is the cold hardness of grapes, grapevines, is the main limiting factor for growing grapes, especially wine grapes here in Ontario. And this research has, uh, the, the research focused on cold hardness has been identified as a priority by the industry. And because of this, uh, there was funding uh, that, was, that were successfully granted to Covey uh, through the AFC, so Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, through the Developing Innovative Agri-Products Agri Initiative, or the DAP, and most recently through the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation's uh, Ontario Research Fund. And through this, in collaborations between AFC, MEDI, GGO, and Covey, I'm able to be here today and do this research. So it's very exciting for me to be here, and, uh, and I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that I'm doing and what we're doing here at Covey. So in terms of grapevine cold hardiness research, a lot of, there's been a lot of shift to Vitus vinifera varieties in, in Ontario and in Canada in general. And these this species of grapevine are make the best uh, wine, but the grapes themselves are not very winter hardy. So cold hardiness is the limiting factor for growing a lot of these varieties. But one of the things is since these grapes do not have a long history in, in Ontario being, for being grown, uh, the, we need to understand a lot of the important factors. Uh, and under our climate or under our climatic conditions. And we have to understand how to optimize cold hardiness to deal with a lot of the cold winters and also weather fluctuations that we see when the vines are getting more hardy <coughs> during acclimation as well as coming out of dormancy deacclimation. And a prime example of some of these weather fluctuations are what we're seeing right now in March. Uh, this year, huge, huge temperature variations. Um, the, the winter was mild. But then all of a sudden we had two, a two week period where we had temperatures above 10 degrees, then above 20 degrees. And those are huge, huge shocks to, to the vine, to just nature in general. 
and I think that's a sign of things to come. And uh, most recently, when I mentioned all the funding through uh, the ORF, the Ontario Research Fund, focusing on our focus is on climate change and, and its impacts on, on our grape and wine industry. And it's a real indication, I think, and very timely uh, funding for, for this type of uh, things that we're seeing. So in terms of the overall objectives of, of my research program, um, one of the first priorities that was identified and objectives that we had was to actually continue to monitor grapevine cold hardiness throughout Ontario and create an advanced web-based database. And uh, this was to, to provide effective tech transfer, transfer for the cold hardiness monitoring we're doing. So last year we created VinAlert, and I'll talk about VinAlert in a little bit. Um, and, and just to show you how, what it is and how we're using it and how it's useful. Some of the other research projects were to further understand how to maximize grapevine cold hardiness, and like I mentioned before, look at the impact of some of the key vineyard management practices and understand what are the most critical factors involved. And all, ultimately to establish a, uh, a grapevine cold hardiness best practices guide for our climate, for our region, uh, so that we can help out our industry. Now when we talk about freeze injury, I'm using the term freeze injury as opposed to, to uh, just winter injury for example. And the reason for that is because freeze injury can occur at any time uh, during the season. It can occur during acclimation when the vines are getting hardy and they're not as, as uh, cold hardy as, as they could be. Midwinter when we have the, the lowest temperatures in, in, in the winter as well as deacclimation such as time right now where the vines are not very cold hardy and even a temperature drop to negative six degrees, for example, can be very detrimental to the vine. And obviously, once we have post bug break and there's green tissue, um, that, that's very, very, the vine can be very, very sensitive. So we can have injury at all of these different times. And whenever we have these types of injury, it likely results in some kind of fruit loss, economic loss, sometimes more vine injury or even vine death. Not only are, is there this loss, but you can, we also have these associated costs of removing the trunks, retraining vines, and obviously replanting the cost of the vines themselves also putting them in the ground. In terms of some of the types of injury, we have the obvious ones that you can see, the direct injury, such as uh, buds. Uh, when a bud is dead, it turns brown. When you cut it open, for example, and also green tissue, when we see um, shoot tips and things like that that are burned. If you look outside right now after this cold event, you see magnolia trees and they were in bloom, they were beautiful. Even after a couple hours, once the temperature warmed up, they were brown. Then we have the indirect or what I call the silent killers and these are some of the damage that occurs within the trunks or in the, or in the tissue themselves within the, the canes. And this is uh, for, so phloem or xylem injury. And this can result in some trunk injury, cane injury, and during the growing season, we think we're all good and fine, and then all of a sudden we have shoot collapse. Also, uh, indirect injury from uh, trunk injury and so on allows some uh, bacteria like crown gall to get into the vines, and that's a, an ongoing problem. So here's just some examples from this past spring in terms of uh, some winter damage. So you can see here, there's, there's bud damage, uh, there's a lot of missing, uh, or a lot of buds that did not burst and we don't have any shoots. Some shoots that are growing are quite weak and stunted. Here's another example where you can see there's, there's massive damage to this, to this vine here and a lot of these vines, and they are throwing some suckers. In some cases, they're not. So this was after a severe cold event of uh, below negative 25, this is Chardonnay. So these vines were at maximum hardiness, but they still dip below the, the threshold for the vines Renifera. Here's just an example of some trunk splitting. So you can see here that the trunk uh, split open because the water inside the trunk froze. And here's an example of, I cut this when I was pruning last week, I cut this trunk out and it had some active shoots that, that grew during the growing season, but look, really that's all that's alive on that whole trunk. So there's a lot of trunk damage that we can get. And this usually is due to successive uh, years of winter damage. And you can see here we have some split trunk and a lot of dead tissue. So these are the ones that really get you because you can't see them until, you, until it's uh, after the fact. Here's an example of freeze injury at uh, post bud break. See some frozen shoots. 
this poor little bud here. Hopefully we don't see any of this. So what is cold hardiness? What are, what are we studying here? Now, cold hardiness is, it is the ability, if you're looking for just a standard definition, it's the ability of a plant tissue to survive freezing. And it's a very complex trait, and there's a lot of contributing factors. There's a lot of genetics at play, a lot of physical changes, physiological changes, and, it, there's a, and a lot of it has to do with the environment as well. So if you're, if you're interested in a lot of the background on cold hardiness, there have been some lectures here. I gave a lecture uh, last year, it should be in the archives, and you can see some of the, uh, some, some of the, the, uh, the factors involved in terms of cold hardiness. It is limited by the genetic potential, so the wild grapevines here, Vitus ripera, for example, are very, very cold hardy. But when you look at the European uh, varieties, for example, uh, the Vitus vinifera, which are, are, are most of our wine grapes, they're only hardy into the negative 20s. And that's at maximum hardiness. Like I said, they're highly influenced by the environmental conditions. If you look at an area such as where we are, where it does get quite cold, the, the vines will get more and more cold hardy until they reach their genetic potential. Whereas in areas such as like Virginia, you see that the vines do not get as cold hardy because their, their environmental conditions don't get as, as cold. And you can also see it's highly dynamic, that it changes throughout the season. And these are nice smoothed out curves. Based on what's happening uh, in the environment, these will actually bounce up and down a little bit. They're not as clean as that. And here's just another example of the acclimation period. This is the period of maximum hardiness and then deacclimation. And the deacclimation curves really depend on the, the spring-like temperatures. So in a year like this year, it'll show uh, it's, it's a very, very straight curve. In terms of how uh, a vine gets cold hardy, uh, if you look at it, this is an example of, of a cane, and you can see here that it actually starts in uh, earlier in the season, and this is an example of mid-September, and the hardiness of the, of the cane moves from the base to the shoe tip. So we see as we move on, the, the cane gets harder and harder along, along, the, uh, along the cane to the tip, and at the end, even late in the season, the tip is quite sensitive. It doesn't really get too hard, cold hardy, but these lower buds can be very, very hardy. And here's an example of, of uh, some data from 2010 in, uh, in October, and you can just see bud position one would be located near the base, and you can see it's a couple degrees hardier than buds at the end of the, the, end of the cane. Now, there's a lot of different uh, sensitivities of buds in, in, and also other tissues uh, with, within the plant. And uh, buds and roots are generally the, the most sensitive then phloem, and then we're getting to some of the, the xylem, and, uh, and so on. This will vary a bit through the season, and right now, what we're telling the growers is that some of these other tissues, like phloem and xylem, once we start getting sap flow, they can actually be uh, less uh, cold tolerant than even the buds, because this, these will change throughout, throughout the season as well. But midwinter, usually these are, are uh, less sensitive, than, than phloem, and especially xylem. But, but once we start getting sap flow, and when we get really close to bud break, these tissues here can be, become very, very sensitive. Now, how are we testing cold hardiness? Uh, what we're using is a, is a method that's very common and currently used. It's called differential thermal analysis. It was actually developed in the 70s, and, uh, and it was actually uh, developed here in Ontario in, uh, and used by Harry, uh, Harvey Kwame from AFC. Now basically the principle of this is it works on uh, the principle of, of exotherms. So when water freezes within the tissue, heat is released, energy is released, and we're able to measure this using some sensitive electronic equipment. So based on this information, we can estimate at, one te at what temperature uh, the tissue in the plant freezes. So here's just uh, an example of, of how this method works. We go collect the cane material from the vineyard, we put a nice bow on it, it's because it's going to uh, be the last, uh, last thing we'll see before it enters the freezer. So we, we wrap, anyways, we label the, the, the buds, we cut the, we cut the buds off the cane, remove the single buds, and they're placed within these trays. Within these trays, we have a reference temperature here, uh, which, which we use, and through all of this uh, electronic equipment, it goes through a multimeter, and we're actually able to determine when these buds freeze. This first peak here is what we call the high temperature exotherm. This is the freezing of extracellular water. This is considered a non-lethal event. 
And these five peaks here, for example, represent one of these, uh, each one of these buds uh, located within one of these cells. So from, from this information, we can see exactly when these buds froze. And you can see there's variability even within um, a sample. So just like I showed you how the, there's differences along the cane, we see that every bud doesn't freeze at the exact same time. What we do is we actually put them into a programmable freezer and we drop the temperature down um, until we know that the buds will die. And then, so this is the ramp temperature as well. So what are some of the current initiatives that we're working on, current studies here at, at Covey? One is the Regional Sampling Program of Blood Hardiness throughout Ontario. And we're also, through this, we're assessing cold hardiness of different cultivars in different locations. Uh, some of the studies that we're working on, which I'm going to get into, are the effects of crop, crop level and harvest dates, the use of geotextile materials as a winter protection method, the use of plant hormones to optimize cold hardiness, and two other, or a couple other initiatives here are looking at the impact of yield and vine water status on cold hardiness as well as disease pressure. So I'm not going to discuss these two today, but I will discuss uh, some of these other ones and some of the things that we're finding and working on. So in terms of crop level, uh, this is one of, one of the, the aspects of, uh, of viticulture a lot of people are concerned with, is the amount of fruit that you put on the vine. How does that impact the, the cold hardiness of, of the plant? So heavy crop loads can enhance the probability and severity of cold injury. It's basically crop stress. You, there's too much crop on that vine. And it's been shown that high crop levels can lead to poor acclimation as well as, uh, as, as poor shoot maturation. Now when it comes to crop levels, there are different, some, some varieties are more sensitive to crop levels than others, so they are cultivar specific. Also, they are site specific conditions as well based on how the vine will grow, will dictate really how much crop you can actually put on that vine. So one of the common practices that we use in viticulture is, is cluster thinning. So we, we will, will remove clusters off the vines, and this can actually improve hardiness uh, in some cases. And the reason for this is basically we're achieving this thing called vine balance. So it's a balance between the amount of crop and the amount of growth on the vine. If you put a ton of crop on a vine, for example, you, will have, you can have stunted shoots. If you don't have enough crop on the vine, you can have excess vine vigor and the vine grows well. So it has to have a balance between those two. So this is part of the, what we're trying to look at here in terms of these crop levels. How, how can they impact cold hardiness? Here's just a, a visual uh, representation of, uh, of different shoot uh, densities as well as cluster thinning uh, and, and some of the impacts on this is just visual, looking at what does the vine look like the next year after, after these types of shoot densities and cluster thinning. So you can see here, this is reason, this work was done in BC by, uh, by Andy Reynolds here at Covey when he was at, uh, when at, at Summerlin. So these, I just wanted to use this as an example. So you can see here, if the vine had uh, 16 shoots per meter row, so it didn't have that many shoots, but they had two clusters per shoot, you can see that the vine didn't survive all that well. The buds didn't survive all that well during after the, uh, the dormant period. Whereas if the, if the rising vine had 36 uh, shoots per meter row and it's thinned down to one cluster per shoot, the vine had uh, more, more vegetative growth and, and a little bit healthier. But ultimately what, he, what was found was that it was basically a happy medium between the two. So these are kind of the two extremes. If you overcrop the vine, don't have enough shoots and have too many clusters, you can end up with this situation. And the other factor is the timing of the harvest. So we have uh, late ripening varieties. A lot of uh, the Bordeaux reds, for example, are later ripening. And, uh, and, and in, years, or in areas such as Ontario, they, we have, we, these varieties are harvested quite late. And so can this later harvest delay cold hardiness? It's one of the, the questions that people have. There has been some work done, and uh, in, the, in other places, they found that, in the, like for Washington State, for example, they found that Cabernet Sauvignon, um, there was no impact on, on when the harvest was for, for that variety. But for our conditions, these, some of these varieties may perform differently, and so this, this research may be uh, is, is very useful, I should say. So a lot of times, if the, if it's thought that if the vine has poor maturity, it probably is less cold hardy. And if it's early maturity and it's picked earlier, it'll, 
it'll acclimate sooner, and it may actually come out of dormancy sooner as well. So this whole concept of early to bed, early to rise. Now when we talk about both crop levels and, and harvest dates, it's, it's, it's very, very important uh, for, for these, uh, these factors in one of our most important products that we make in Canada, and uh, Ontario is the largest producer of this, and this is ice wine and late harvest wines. And the, one of the key things with ice wine is that the harvest occurs after leaf fall, so the, it's, a, it's definitely a late harvest. They're used, the vines are usually crop heavier, so we're going to have multiple factors at play. We have both uh, higher crop levels and we have late harvest. Now anecdotally, and in some, in some years we've seen that ice wine vines can have lower bud survival. Why is that? Is that because of the crop level? Is it because of the harvest date? Is it because of um, other factors at play? And also the other question that, that is commonly asked in the industry is if I crop that same uh, vineyard, same block over and over again with ice wine, am I gonna, is that going to impact the vine hardness or the health of the vines? So this is where this study is, is coming from. So this current study looking at crop level and harvest date is has, it ties in a lot with, with, uh, with what we grow and, and also what kind of wine styles we produce. So we have these uh, earlier harvests, which would be considered for sparkling wines. We have normal harvests for your standard table wine, and as well as late harvests for um, late harvest ice wine, as well as some apostamental style wines if the vines are left to, uh, or if the grapes are left to hang on the vines for an extended period of time to get some, uh, some drying and desiccation of those berries on vine. So for this study, what we've done is looking at uh, a number of important cultivars in our region and also looking at two different crop levels, a full crop and a half crop, in different harvest dates. So an earlier harvest or standard harvest and then a late harvest as well. And these tie in with the enological aspects of, of the, uh, the ORF project that, we're, that we have funding for. So here's an example of just some data from this past year looking at um, acclimate, this is just acclimation in Sauvignon Blanc. So you can see here, this is some baseline data uh, from, from September. You can see this is the hardiness of these vines, all the different treatments um, in September. And you can see they're still, they're hardy to negative four, negative five, and so on. This is when there's still a lot of fruit in the vine and we think, oh, it's still early, it's the beginning of harvest. But the vines are starting to get ready for winter. So that's an important point I do want to point out here. You can see, uh, looking at the two extremes, now this is now in October. If you look at for, uh, vines, the treatment that was had half a crop, which was one cluster per shoot, and it was picked, uh, it would have been picked just prior to this, you can see that the hardiness of those vines are much more than the full crop with, with, with the later harvest. So this had full crop and it hadn't been picked yet. And you can see it's three, at least three degrees more, more hardy than this other, this other treatment which had still the full crop on it and it, was, and it wasn't picked. Um, in general, the, the, the lighter crops had greater hardiness, uh, even, with the, even with the late harvest, for example, as well. Now we get into November, and you can still see that the highest, uh, the most hardy uh, treatment, or the most hardy vines were the treatment for the half crop and they were picked early. So there seemed to be the largest difference is right in this acclimation period here, and this is an example graphically. Now this is LT50 data, so the, the predicted temperature at which 50% of the buds would be, would be killed. And you can see that the, the full crop, late harvest, it acclimated at a much slower rate than some of these other treatments, whereas the half crop, late harvest for example, just having less crop, it was more hardy. And it had followed a, a similar trend. You can see it was, it was a bit more hardy and it followed the, a similar trend uh, for both, uh, both late harvests here. Whereas the, the, the crop that was picked right away, the vines uh, acclimated at a faster rate. Then we had the second harvest, the later harvest, which occurred uh, oh, a month later. Uh, you can see after that harvest occurred, then the vines started to catch up a bit, and, uh, and as we moved on closer to maximum hardiness, the, tr the treatments became less and less more uh, evident in terms of differences between um, vine hardiness. But uh, the lowest crop in, that was picked early 
have the maximum of hardiness uh, going into December. Now here's an example of looking at Pinot Noir, and similarly, the full crop treatments, again, they, they were less hardy during the acclimation period. Uh, here's the, the half crop, but then once we, again, once the fruit came off, um, they, they were pretty much mirror images, and you can see now there's not much difference at all. And even after the second harvest, uh, there wasn't too, too much difference either. So early in, earlier on in acclimation seems to be the times where we have the, the largest differences in terms, of these, uh, in terms of these treatments. And crop levels seem to have a, a big impact as well. Looking at Riesling, uh, Riesling in general, the, the full crop uh, late treatment was again low, uh, at the, sorry, yeah, this, in this case, this one seemed to be a bit more hardy, but it didn't acclimate at the very beginning, but it didn't acclimate um, at the same rates as these other ones. But in general, there, there wasn't a heck of a lot of difference here with Riesling. Um, I've got some reasons why I think that's the case, but uh, I'll talk about those in a second. And the same with Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc, there wasn't hardly any difference at all during acclimation, but now we're starting to see some differences Leading up to deacclimation here, some of the vines seem to come out of uh, and deacclimate at a different rate than some of these other ones. So the, uh, the the fruit that was sorry, yeah, the vines that had only half crop on them seem to deacclimate quicker in the in the season. Um, Cabernet Franc was one of those varieties that, with our poor fall that we had last year with a lot of wet weather, it was picked very very late. Even our even the um, the standard harvest was quite late. So by the time the fruit came off, the leaves basically were falling off the vine as well. And I think that that goes into play when we talk about some of the harvest date issues is that it's, it can't, might be year dependent. So what are some of the results from, from uh, the first year of study? Now I've only focused on, um, on bud hardiness because I want to get through a lot of the different projects here and talk about a lot of things. But um, in terms of results to date, it seems that crop level does have some effects uh, in terms of cold hardiness. But most of the greatest impacts are found during, de or dur during acclimation. Harvest dates seem to have less of an impact, but an early harvest, especially a, a really early harvest like with Sauvignon Blanc, for example, can lead to some early increases in, in hardiness during acclimation. There, with Cabernet Franc, for example, we saw a little bit of this early to bed, early to rise concept where the vines that acclimated sooner and got to maximum, maximum hardiness sooner seem to be deacclimating first compared to the other treatments. And this is similar to some of the work that was found in other regions uh, in Virginia, in uh, Ohio, and in Washington State that the largest impact seemed to be during acclimation. But this was a bit of a tough vintage for the harvest, for the harvest state trials at least, like I said, because the, the, the vines were um, or the fruit was picked very, very late, and the integrity of the fruit also um, suffered a bit for the late harvest because of all the rains that we had. But that's why you do many years of, multiple years of studies for, for these types of things. So some of the ongoing work that we're doing with this, with this study is looking at the effects of crop level and harvest date, the combined effects, and looking at what the relationships between uh, these various treatments uh, blood hardiness as well as some of the carbohydrates that are associated with cold hardiness. So we're using HPLC to measure some of the key uh, oligosaccharides such as raffinose, stachyose, and so on. We're also be out pruning the next week and we'll be able to get some, uh, some vine vigor, some vine size measurements and we can look at some in, uh, the interactions between cold hardiness and vine balance and crop, actual crop loads. So looking at the index, the ratios between um, vine vigor and, and crop levels or in yields, so yields and vigor, and also use a lot of statistical analysis to interpret this data. So just some thoughts so far as, as we moved on through this, through this study for this year, we're getting near the end of the first year of data collection here. And it does seem that there are some variety of responses that certain varieties may be impacted more than others. Uh, under our conditions. Uh, there may be an optimal crop level or crop load for these different varieties without compromising fruit quality. What happens if there's a very, if it's a very early harvest for, versus a very late harvest? One thing that we see is that when you do pick a, um, 
pick the fruit when it's late, the vine will immediately lose its leaves. So are we getting an effective harvest date? Maybe not. Whereas if it's earlier on, you may have that time where there's leaves still on the vine and there's still carbohydrates being produced by, by those leaves and, and can go to some of the permanent organs of the plant as opposed to uh, going into the fruit when if it's, if it's left hanging. Obviously growing season and vintage differences, comparing multiple years, you need to do this in this type of work. And uh, the one thing I noticed, and, and it was quite obvious in that uh, Cabernet Franc data, was just the later season didn't really allow much time between harvest and leaf fall. Um, the vineyard that we did a lot of the work in had some winter injury, uh, unfortunately, and so the crop levels weren't as heavy as, as, uh, as liked. We hope to get higher crop levels this year, and having more crop on the vine may have a greater impact on some of those crop level uh, aspects. I just want to talk about a couple other cultural practices here. These are uh, just some work that I'm, I'm doing and also some other work that's been, that's been done. Uh, here's just an example of training system. People are always curious, well, what are training systems? What impact does it have on, on vines? So two commonly used systems here in, in Ontario are uh, Pendlebogen and Scott Henry. So Scott Henry is a divided canopy, vertically divided canopy, and, uh, and the Pendlebogen is your standard uh, VSP. So there's two, there's Pendlebogen, here's an example of Scott Henry. What you can see here is that the Scott Henry vines seem to acclimate a little bit, or not, they acclimate at similar rates, but the cold hardiness was, was less for, in Scott Henry vines during acclimation. But after mid-January, all of the vines seem to have the same amount of cold hardiness. And I've continued to look at some of this, uh, and, and some of the data sets, and so on, and there may be a small difference between, let's say, uh, hardiness in the upper canopy and lower canopy, but generally speaking, um, there's not very much difference between uh, the different training systems in terms of bud hardiness. Another interesting thing is clones. People are always asking about clones. Here's just an example of two Syrah clones uh, sampled at St. David's Bench. One's clone one and one clones 100. And you can see here that one of these clones Clone, uh, clone 1, for example, acclimates a lot sooner than clone 100. But then we get, uh, by the time we get into February, January, February, they're basically at their maximum hardiness. So the, that, the, they basically reach their, their maximum hardiness for, for Syrah. Now this is interesting uh, that there are some clonal differences and it's, there's growers and, and people in the industry who are looking more into this and selecting vines uh, based on uh, on their characteristics, and it's, it's something that's very interesting and, uh, and worthy of probably doing some more research on as we move forward. Another commonly asked question is pruning. What happens if I prune early versus I prune late? This is some older data, and it's from Concord, but I think it, it does show some, some interesting data here. Uh, looking at early pruning versus unpruned, and testing cold hardiness. So these uh, cold hardiness measurements were taken end of the season, so you know March 30th, so right around this time. And you can see here that vines that were pruned earlier on were, were less hardy than those that were pruned late. Also look look at water content in the vine, similarly, there's more there's sorry, there's more water in uh, in, in the canes in the in the earlier pruned vines. So if you if you prune early, you you can uh, get the vines moving quicker during the deacclimation period. There's um, there's things that are probably initiated in the plant, and when they're deactivating, there's there's less water going or, or less uh, plant material for to deactivate. So the, once the vine starts, it's, there's less there's less there to do. And we're seeing some of this right now in terms of some of the uh, the vines that we're sampling and buds that we're sampling across the region. Some of the earlier varieties, such as Chardonnay, that were pruned earlier on, seem to be less hardy than some of our Bordeaux reds, like Merlot, which, are, which can be quite sensitive, but if they were left unpruned, they seem to be a bit more hardy. But at this point in time, to be honest, everything isn't very hardy. So. <clears throat> but we have found a little bit of difference in, in terms of timing of pruning. This is kind of a gimme, but it just wanna, I just took this picture actually from a cell phone out in a vineyard this, uh, this fall, and here's an example of just uh, flooded, uh, a flooded vineyard, and you can see here this vine has lost a lot of its leaves. It's got stunted growth, and look at all that green tissue. 
on that, on that vine. When I showed that one slide with uh, acclimation of canes, you could see how periderm formation and periderm formation is highly correlated with bud hardiness and cane hardiness. So you can expect that these canes will not be too, too cold hardy. So in terms of just some of the general findings, training systems seem to have minimal impact in terms of maximum hardiness. And I'm saying if it's managed well. Most of these vineyards that I've been, or all of these vineyards I've been sampling in, have done what they're supposed to do with those training systems. The one thing I will say though is that some systems may be more susceptible to injury just based on the nature of the systems. If it's a high cordon system, for example, there's a lot more perennial wood uh, and, and, and you can have more uh, susceptibility to injury, for example. So the clones is quite interesting that there, there seems to be an impact of clones and will this lead to Canadian vines and selections? And like I said, there's some very innovative people in our industry that have done this work and are continuing to do work like this. Uh, one thing I wanted to address was rootstocks. Uh, there's a lot of talk about rootstocks. It has that impact cold hardiness. Uh, what well, rootstocks can help you do is help manage vigor and you may help that vine acclimate a bit sooner. But at the end of the day, that scion on top of that rootstock, that, what's grafted to that rootstock, will not be any more cold hardy. It still is, if it's Merlot grafted to a rootstock, it's still Merlot and it's still going to be sensitive. Pruning can impact hardiness, especially, uh, especially now during deacclimation. You can expect that the vines are pruned or they will deacclimate sooner. And also, a dimension of poor drainage, it can impede vine acclimation. Now, one of the other areas of interest uh, that I'm working on is the use of geotextiles for winter protection. And geotextiles are, are commonly used uh, to protect crops from, from the cold winters. And they're used a lot in the Quebec vineyards. And when we traveled to Quebec, we, uh, we saw some of these geotextiles and they seem to be, uh, and we found it very interesting. There's a lot of interest of how, what impact are these having on, on the vines and, and uh, on their cold hardiness. Now, in, now, lately there's been a lot of interest in Ontario to using these types of geotextile materials. And what are, the, what are some of the reasons? One is that vinifera that's planted in many areas need protection. Uh, you can't just go with, uh, with wind machines and expect that to work because the minimum temperatures get so low, they actually need some, kind of, some type of protection. There's concern, more and more concern about moving a lot of soil. So this is an example of some buried vines. When you hill those up, um, there, you have to move a lot of soil. There's concern about that. Also concern about damaging buds when you're hilling or dehilling, as well as just standard bud rot and loss when, you're, when you do this. The other problem is timing and weather. Um, so using soil to, to bury things can be, uh, can be problematic if it's too wet, for example. So, it turned there was a need to examine some of these materials further. We had basically three research questions. One was, how effective are these materials at mitigating damaging cold temperatures? Now, do these materials cause a greenhouse effect? So, are you baking and heating up the, the plant material underneath these textiles? And what are, what's the impact of this on bud hardiness and ultimately bud survival? And also try to help determine a best practices. So, timing of putting these textiles on, off, and so on. So we initiated a small trial this year with uh, Sugarbush Vineyards and, and Margaret Appleby from Amafra looking at using some of these geotextile materials. So here's just an example of, of one of these geotextile materials. These are actually just covering up one of our treatment panels. So we used eight panels of vines that were under textile and they were randomized within, within the Chardonnay block and basically had two different methods. One was the textile was laid down right over top the canes that were tied to the lower wire. And normally they would, they would lay the one cane down and then cover that, that cane with soil. Instead, what we did was we covered it with the geotextile material. The second method was uh, have the vine on the fruiting wire and just spur prune uh, the, the vine and then put the, the material right over top. So that could be a really quick way. You just go in after you pick, spur prune so you leave uh, short shoots, uh, a couple buds, and then just cover it with the material. Looked at temperature underneath the material as well as the ambient temperature, and then also sample buds for cold hardiness. In the winter, when that's frozen, it can be kind of tough. So I put some flags up top so I knew where my where my tagged uh, canes would be. Now this gets a little bit hairy. There's a lot of points here, but I just want to try to walk you through this. This is looking at temperature under the textile, which is in the blue, 
and then the temperature, the ambient temperature was just the red. And you can see here, I'll, I'll point out a couple of events. These are some of the, the nights where it got very, very cold. And you can see here that the ambient temperature actually was about negative 23 degrees uh, in this vineyard, in the case for this vineyard. Underneath the textile, it was about negative 50. So there was some, some temperature mitigation. Again, at this, at this time frame, again, temperatures dripped dip down all the way to here. Under the textile, it was only here, it was above negative 10. But if you look, you see, if, you, if you just look at colors, the red, all the red here, the ambient temperature, you can see how, how much lower they get than a lot of the blues. But on the other, on the flip side of things, you can see here that the, a lot of the blues, so under the textile, we're getting a lot of maximum temperatures too that are quite higher. During acclimation, they were quite, uh, quite uh, even, not too many differences. And if you look right now, in, this pa in the past month, Look at how the geotextile impacted uh, at the maximum temperatures underneath. Uh, under, so, under, so yeah, so what the vines were experiencing underneath that textile. But then, in the last week or so, when we had those really high temperatures, there wasn't all that much difference. And so, it's it's quite interesting. So, I wanted to point that out based on this next piece of information. Here's the bud hardiness for 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 vines. This is Chardonnay, by the way, underneath uh, or exposed to the ambient air. In our the textile, and I just pointed out a couple uh, time, times here that mid January, so at maximum hardiness, the vines that were exposed to the air were, especially if you look at the LT10 data, about four degrees more hardy. But if you look at this past, so there, so it does seem that the by not exposing the vine to as cold of temperatures as with the the ones at ambient temperature, they didn't get these vines here didn't get as cold hardy. But if you look right here from the latest sampling, I just got this data this morning, you can see there's not really any differences. So I was trying to wrap my head around this a bit, and one is we had these extreme temperatures, very, very warm, and underneath that uh, textile, it's white material, so some of the heat might have been reflected, and also the tissue itself um, is brown, and it's, we've had all this strong sun and, and warm, uh, warm air, and, I, and I'm wondering if the tissue itself warmed up a lot more uh, for, for uh, relatively speaking, for the ambient. I don't know, it's, it's quite interesting. I would have suspected that these vines would have been a lot uh, more cold, cold hardy than these ones. So again, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, again, I wanna continue to, to look at this. So in terms of, uh, in terms of some of the preliminary conclusions here, they do seem to moderate the, the minimum temperature extremes. There seem to be some greenhouse-like effects, uh, especially during the, the winter period. There is, and because of that, there is there does seem to be a little bit of reduction in maximum hardiness. But we're still looking at more data here for during deacclimation, as well as what, what are the impacts of bud break and also bud survival between the two. Uh, and then we're looking at some of the best practices, timing and removal of, of these. If if you start seeing a lot of high temperatures, is it best to get it off? And what happens if you leave them, get them on too early or, or, or leave them on too late? Uh, some of the other factors are just in general, uh, not from, so much from a research standpoint, but just logistics, some of the cost involved with these materials, and how durable are they? So we really like to continue this study and expand and looking at different geotextile materials and, uh, and again, continue to see how, how these work and what impact they have on vines. Um, finally, just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go over this quickly. Um, there are a lot of plant growth regulators out there. Hormones are involved with uh, a lot of plant processes, including all the development of, of, of the plant, between bud break, uh, just root, just general growth, fruit development and dormancy. And um, there are some available, different formulations available to, to actually spray on vines. And people always ask, is there something I can spray on my vine to make it more hardy? Well, we were trying to, we we're investigating this right now. None of these are registered in Canada, by the way. And they, but they have been used, some of these hormones are used in the U.S. for table grape production uh, to, let's say, loosen up the cluster, elongate the cluster in table grapes or help improve color. So this is a, a study that we're working on here at Covey, but with uh, the assistance and joint study with, uh, with PARC, and Pat Bowen at PARC, Washington State University, the USDA, as well as Val Biosciences who produce this stuff. So in, in a nutshell, what are we doing? We're putting post-harvest application of different sprays 
onto Merlot vines. So after the fruit's picked, organists were spraying uh, different formulations on these vines. So we basically have five different formulations in a, in a control. And this work's being done in Niagara Lake. Here's just an example. I'm not going into detail in terms of what the sprays themselves actually are. But just look at this control line, which is the red line. And you can see here that the control treatments throughout much of the season are a heck of a lot less hardy than the, than the treatments that have been sprayed. So this may be a, an interesting uh, product to use down the road if, uh, if registered, if it's cost, uh, uh, cost prohibitive. Right now what we're seeing is a heck of a lot of deacclimation. Like that just shows what's, what's happening here uh, in terms of, in terms of um, the season right now. Is that's, that's a very, very quick uh, deacclimation curve. But the least hard, one of the least hardy is the control treatment. So we'll see what impact that's going to have. Again, looking at, that was LT10 data, LT50 data shows, again, they really helped, the treatments really seem to increase hardiness, especially during acclimation. But if you see here, we basically max out at some point where Merlot gets as hardy as it's going to get. Doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to change the genetics of that one. So that was just an interesting, uh, interesting point. So some of the things that we're looking at here is that we found that there's a lot of LT10 differences. So it seemed that the hormone spray on the vines seemed to really increase the hardiness on, the, on some of the more extreme areas of the, of the, like the tips of the vine, for example. And, and, and there's less extremes along that cane. So it did seem to help out with some of the acclimation because they were less susceptible to 10% uh, to bite kill. But ultimately, for the LT50 data, we didn't find any differences uh, here in Ontario for, for some of the uh, LT50 data, for some of the treatments. So, is there going to be interest in, will it be a delayed blood break? I don't know. This is something to look at. So, because we're in this situation right now with all these warm temperatures, I really wanted to talk a little bit about what we're finding right now, what's currently happening happening around uh, Ontario in terms, of, in terms of blood hardiness. So here's just a summary of, of the fall, so during the acclimation, to the present time. So just in words, uh, hardiness was slightly lower during the acclimation. A lot of this was due to the, to the wet uh, conditions that we did have. We had a very mild winter, and I'll show you some of the temperature data in a minute. And the vines were still, but the vines were still quite winter hard. In March, the very beginning of March, we were in fantastic shape. The temperatures were quite warm, the vines were very, very hardy, very little bud uh, damage at all. But then what happened was we had these abnormally high March temperatures. And I'll talk about this in a second, but what happens is the vines, uh, when we have warm temperatures, it really starts to deacclimate the vines. And so because of, this, of these high temperatures, we've lost a lot of cold hardiness in all of our varieties. And as a result, we're about four weeks ahead right now compared to last year. So there's many weeks of, of potential risk of injury. And we had one of those potential uh, damaging cold events just the other night when it dropped down to, to negative six in some areas. So where is all this data stored? So all of this regional sampling we're doing, all of the cold hardiness or work that we do, all goes to this advanced cold hardiness database called FindMiller. So this was launched in November of, of 2010. And we've expanded uh, some of the features over the, over the last uh, year or so. And what you can see here is we have uh, many different tabs. We have just an overview of, of the program, what we're doing in terms of the cold hardiness uh, monitoring and bud survival monitoring and so on. Uh, we have a recent tab to show the most recent data collected, and this is very important at the time of year, such as right now, where the where the buds where the buds are getting less and less uh, cold tolerant. So every single day, they're going to be less hardy. We have the general bud hardiness tab, where all of the bud hardiness data can be found, as well as bud survival bud survival data, and then alerts where you can sign up to have customized uh, alert notification. So if I'm in Prince Edward County, for example, well, every time there's new data posted for Prince Edward County, that data will be, uh, an email will, send, will be sent to you saying there's new data available for that particular cultivar you're signed up for. 
as well as a resource section, which has a lot of the information that we relate to the, to the industry as well as other, uh, other programs. So here's just an example of Chardonnay, uh, the, the entire pool hardness profile from when we started sampling in October all the way to present time, uh, the, as of, as of uh, yesterday. So here's just a snapshot of the vinyl alert screen. So you can see you can select based on uh, region by cultivar and by year. Excuse me. What we have here are the LT10, LT50, LT90 data. So the estimated temperatures at which 10% buds kill, 50% bud kill, 90% bud kill. And then this is um, minimum temperature data from uh, a weather station associated to this, to this location. So here are, are all the, your minimum temperatures. And you can see from this, from, uh, from the temperature data and, and the bud hardness data that they, they go on a similar trend, right? And they, as the temperatures decrease, hit maximum hardening, or most minimum temperatures, the, the buds are at their maximum hardness. And look what this warm weather, look at these minimums. March minimums of 10 degrees, that's not highs, those are minimums. Our highs would be way up here. And you can see that the vines have just deacclimated at a tremendous rate, very, very quick rate. But our mild winter, look, look at this, not very many temperatures above uh, or below zero for minimums. But the vines still were quite hardy, which was an interesting thing to see. How does this compare to, to multiple years? Again, Chardonnay from 2009, 2010, and 2011-12 season. So 2000, this is where we're at right now. This, if you follow the, uh, the red curve, you can see that the vines didn't get as cold hardy as they did in 2010, 2011. Remember last winter was very cold and the vines actually got down uh, a little bit more, uh, or got to be a little more cold hardy than they were in this past, during this past winter. But then we had a cool and wet spring. And look at that, it was a, it was a slower rate compared to this year. This year, it just de we, do, we lost a lot of deacclimation in a matter of even a couple of days. We always thought 2009, 2010 was an early season. If you recall, if you know, if you know on, uh, the Ontario history, this was a very early bump rate this year. So we're about two weeks ahead compared to 2009. So that just shows the variability we have from year to year. And we talk about uh, climate change. We talk about all of these risks that are associated with agriculture, I think this really shows a lot. And look at the variability we have maximum hardness, the, ma the differences during, uh, not as much during acclimation, but around here during deacclimation. and think about some of these spikes that we get. Look at this, up and down, up and down, and that's really, really critical, and uh, one example is this one right here, where you can see the temperatures drop down, it's similar this was actually from today, so you can actually see that result from, from two nights ago when the minimum data was posted on Vinyl Alert. You could just see how close that we can get and, and at uh, negative, negative five this time of year, you'd just be laughing. You know, it's not going to do anything, but now, big risk because of, because of this deacclimation. And you can see just here how different varieties perform as well. There's some variation in just some, some of the vines themselves. Uh, and some of the varieties, I should say, uh, Merlot is a heck of a lot less winter hardy than Chardonnay and Cabernet Franc, which are pretty similar here. But Merlot, in this particular year, did not, uh, this most recent year, did not uh, acclimate as deep as, uh, as some of the other varieties. So where do we go from here? Well, we're going to be at this continued, this continued risk until we're uh, well above freezing temperatures. The vines are going to continue to deacclimate. They probably won't be seeing a curve like that, but we will we'll be seeing it move more along the line like that. And we'll be, uh, from this point on, at, at risk. We're way, way ahead. So it's, this, is, this is part of the reason why we, we're monitoring these, these, uh, these vines and looking at cold hardiness is, without this information, how do you know how cold hardy the buds would be? When you know, like, I wouldn't have guessed that the vines would react that quickly. And so this information can be very useful to the people in the industry and uh, when to turn on wind machines, when to use uh, helicopters and so on. And every year is different. It's, it's not, to, not like you can predict it at all.
So just some final conclusions and thoughts. Cold injury, it's, it's a major threat to the grape wine industry. It doesn't matter where you are. In Canada, it's in Ontario, it's a bit more relevant, but no matter where you are, you're at the risk of cold injury. Uh, frost, even in warm areas. If you look at California, people think, oh, it's very warm there. Last year, they got hit by a frost, and it's always, there's always risk of cold injury. So what are we doing? Trying to help understand the factors involved and using some of the best cultural practices. And that's where some of the overview of some of the research that I, that I talked about. I know I went through it quickly, but I just wanted to give a, a sense of what we're doing right now. And uh, there's just a lot of work being done. So with this better understanding of what the factors are and how we can use best practices, combined with the ability to provide this timely information to the industry, to the Great Borough community, and through Vinylur, this will help reduce, I feel, the, the, the continued threat of of winter injury. And I think this is especially true in a year like this one that we're having, where, well, we're, throwing, we're kind of throwing our hands up, like, this is just nuts, but uh, at least we're working hard to try to have uh, the data available and understand what, what is happening, what are some of the factors we could do to maybe minimize some of these, uh, because the weather's not going to change, right? It's only going to get worse. We're going to have more extremes, so we have to try to have the vines in the best shape we can have them in. And like I said, the impact of climate change is going to lead to more of these extremes and weather fluctuations. Just some acknowledgements. All the different uh, funding agencies and stakeholders are involved with this project and, and some collaborators here. So we have through the Great Growers of Ontario, and Ontario Great Brewing Research, uh, Inc., WIN, KCMS, funding through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the Ontario Research Fund, MEDI, and also uh, valid biosciences for their assistance with uh, the hormone work. And you can just see all of the people that are involved with all this work. And I'm fortunate to work with a lot of great people from all over the, all over the woods. But here at Covey, uh, some of the technical support from Lisa Dowling, Fred DiProfio, and Laurie Kwame. Uh, very hard work in terms of uh, a lot of the butt analysis and, and HPLC work. Obviously, uh, Dr. Debbie Ingalls. Mary Jasinski, who's a graduate student working in the Reynolds lab, as well as Andy Reynolds, uh, for support and since I use his lab. Um, KCMS, for all of their, their assistance, and I work with them a lot with the regional sampling. Brock Technical Services, uh, the guys in electronics are amazing. Tom McDonald and Mike DeLang, they're the ones that uh, maintain and, and help problem shoot any of, any of our freezer issues, which uh, we totally rely on. Uh, Vine Alert and their web developer Dwight, a lot of the industry partners, uh, Charlie Sharms for their assistance, Andrew Keller Limited, Sugar Bush, and many, many growers who, who let us use their vineyards. It's amazing. Staff at GGO and some of my collaborators that I'm working with, uh, Dr. Pat Bowen from Park, as well as Derek from Valent, Margaret Appleby from Omafra, as well as uh, John Jensen who looks after the vineyard at the uh, Vine Research Innovation Center, Cherry Avenue Vineyard. So thank you very much for your attention. If you want to tune into Vinyl Alert, there's the link right there. Please use it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great service, and I'd like to, uh, like to thank you. Thank you, Jim, for a, a great informative talk. Uh, we've got time for some questions. Are there questions from the audience? Brett, please start right. us off. Can you uh, uh, put a number to how much Less hardy the bloom and zymatic tissue might be at this point. Approximately. Uh, I I play around with some testing of phloem and um, and and xylem, but I would say it's a couple of degrees less hardy than LT50 for sure, probably LT10. So definitely less hardy than the buds at this point. Especially the, the higher the LT values are right now, I would say the more tender the, the phloem is. Does that make sense? So if a vine is let's say is at negative 12, mm -hmm. and then we have another vine or another cultivar that's LT50 is of negative 6, for example. I would say that phloem for the vine that has LT50 negative 6 is way less uh, tender, or way more tender than mm -hmm. uh, negative 4 or 3. Yeah, probably negative 4. Uh, I, I can't put an actual number. But, but it's, it's, something it, 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 it's something we're working on, and it's going to be less than, um, than the LT50 for the L10 for the bud, I should say. 
So we'll do that this stage. Playing it safe with the vinyl machines. Yes, I would play it safe. Yeah. You can have some flow damage and the vine will still be okay. The vine can, can be functional at even a 50% flow injury, but you still don't want to have flow injury, so try to prevent, to try to prevent it. But we're, we're definitely working on uh, doing more flow analysis and, and other tissue hardiness uh, analysis. Is there any way to measure that flow hardiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could we could use the freezer. Same thing. Yeah. Peaks are just a little bit different uh, in terms of in terms of uh, what they look like and so on. But you could estimate flow on So hopefully by next year, mm -hmm. Jim, go ahead because I don't have my phone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So for next year, we'll we'll be uh, measuring this. Might there be a difference in the uh, foam hardness between trunk and, and uh, younger tissue? Pain tissue, for instance? Measuring things in the trunk are very difficult, so I don't know. I would think that the younger, uh, younger, younger vines in general uh, are less uh, cold tolerant than older vines, for example, and that has a lot to do with the uh, just the nature of Perm and so on. Uh, so there may be, the canes may be more susceptible in the trunk, but I don't know. And usually it's successive in injury as well that, that occur that leads to that. So a trunk will have more opportunities to have winter injury than uh, a cane, for example, or a cordon even. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, you indicated that you have a that you had a, a recent tab, and it was very important this time of year to access the data on the recent tab. Now, I know that why it's so important is because of the amount of time that it gets, it takes to sample all the different uh, regions that we're sampling from. But can you just explain this to the, to the rest of the audience in terms of why it's so important at this time of rapid deacclimation to make use of the data that's under the recent tab? Mm -hmm. So the question was related to what is the importance of, of the recent tab on Weimar and why you should be looking at the recent tab, recent tab at this time of year. The reason why the recent tab is on Vine Alert is the fact that during deacclimation, and especially in a year like this year where we have a lot of extreme temperatures, the vines will deacclimate very, very rapidly and we, and we have seen that in the data. Because we are sampling from very from many locations and we're on a two-week schedule, we cannot get all the sampling done within a couple of days. So what we have is this recent tab, so that the most recent data is present. And that way, it, uh, you can when you look on Vine Alert, you can um, immediately click on that tab and see the most current data. And that's the most critical data to use is the most recent, regardless of variety and location because of things are changing so quickly. And that's why that recent tab is there and why you should be using that at this time of year. Because some of your data may not be relevant for your location, just because we haven't gotten around to sample it yet. Any other questions from the group? Okay, well, uh, Jim, thank you very much uh, for your, your talk and uh, fielding our questions. And we have a small token of our appreciation uh, for you. And also, just before we uh, uh, all clap, uh, and thank you for the talk, uh, just a reminder that our next lecture is on April the 4th. It's Dr. George Vandermerva uh, from the University of Guelph, who's also a Cubby Fellow. And he'll be talking about getting started, adaptation of wine yeast to early fermentation stress. So we look forward to seeing you all uh, next week, uh, same time, same place. Thank you.